Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, as Jacob said, I'm Paul Whitcover, the um, Associate Dean of the Online MFA, and I want to introduce our guest. Um, we are thrilled to have Morgan Talty with us tonight. Morgan, a citizen of the Penobscot Indian Nation, is the author of the criti critically acclaimed short story collection, Night of the Living Res from Tin House Books, which won the 2022 New England Book Award for Fiction and the 2022 John Leonard Prize from the National Book Critics Circle and was a finalist for the 2022 Barnes and Noble Discover Great New Writers and the 2023 Arne, Arne, excuse me, Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. His writing has appeared in Granta, The Georgia Review, Shenandoah, Tri-Quarterly, Narrative Magazine, Lit Hub, and elsewhere. A winner of the 2021 Narrative Prize, Morgan has been supported in his work by the Elizabeth George Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. He is an assistant professor of English in creative writing and Native American and contemporary literature at the University of Maine, Orono, and is on the faculty of the Stone Coast MFA in creative writing, as well as the Institute of American Indian Arts. He is also a prose editor at the Massachusetts Review, and he lives in Levant, Maine. Please help me in welcoming Morgan to tonight's event. Morgan, we are so thrilled to have you, as we said. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, I always forget how extremely long my bio is. Like yeah, visually, it looks like short, but then when people read it, I'm like, God, that's really, really long. Um, well, you, you've just got to stop winning so many awards, you know, and publishing in yeah. so many places. It's and yeah, then you'll have a shorter bio. When they did the re when they did a reprint of my book, they were like, we don't know what. Uh, we don't we, we don't think we'll be able to fit all the the awards on your, right. on your book and. They uh, they they weren't able to, but that was okay because that would have just looked like way too boasting. But right, um, right. yeah, no, well, I've just been very happy and grateful for the success of the book. It's, yeah. it's exceeded my expectations wildly. So yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's an incredible book, and I, I recommend it to uh, to everyone um, in the audience tonight. Um, you're going to hear in just a minute. Morgan, read a little bit from it, and then we'll jump into the the Q&A part of the evening. So Morgan, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to read the first story um, from Night of the Living Reds, which is uh, titled Burn. And Night of the Living Reds, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, is it's an interconnected story collection. Um, some say it's a novel, some say it's a story collection, some say it's an interconnected story collection. Um, I like to think you can pick you can open any of these stories and read them in, in any order um, and you know out of order if you want and uh, the stories follow the same character just at different points in his life so this story we're reading burn we'll see d who is an older version of david who we'll see and who we see in the next chapter um, or in the next story and then in the next story we see d again much older and there's these two timelines sort of like creeping slowly, you know, towards each other. And there's this pressing question about, you know, what happened to this good natured boy that we encounter um, in, in a jar? And how did he become this, um, you know, this addict who's estranged from his family? And, you know, where did his family even go? Um, so a lot of questions that we, we build to that I kind of ask the reader to piece together. But um, this is Burn, and this, I think, really sets the tone for the book. So Burn. Winter, and I walk the sidewalk at night along banks of hard snow. I come from Rab's apartment off the reservation. Rab, this white guy with a wide mouth and eyes that closed up when he laughed, sold pot. He was all no bullshit, too. I had asked for a gram, and after he weighed it and put it in a plastic baggie and held it out to me, I reached into my pants and jacket pockets looking for the cash among the cigarette wrappers and pocket knife. And he didn't believe me as I acted the part and kept saying, shit, 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 it must have fell out on the walk over here. He shook his head, took the weed out of the baggie and put it back into his mason jar. I ain't smoking you up, he said. And so then I said, fuck you, Rab. I really did lose the money. You'll see. Watch when I come back here. With in watch when I come back here in 30 minutes with the money I dropped. You feel stupid then. He shrugged his sorry, man, and I slammed his door shut as I left. At the bridge to the reservation, the river was still frozen, ice shining white blue under a full moon. The sidewalk on the bridge hadn't been shoveled since the last nor'easter crap snow in November. And I walked in the blueprints everyone made who walked the walk to Overtown to get pot or catch the bus to wherever it was us Skeegans had to go. 
which wasn't anywhere because everything we needed, except pot, was on the res. Well, except Best Buy or Bed Bath and Beyond. But those natives who bought 4K Ultra DVDs or fresh white doilies had cars, wouldn't be taking the bus like me or fellas did each day to the methadone clinic. That was another thing the res didn't have, a methadone clinic. We had sacred grounds where sweats and peyote ceremonies happened once a month. Except since I had chosen to take methadone, I was ineligible to participate in native spiritual practice, according to the doc on the res. Natives damning natives. The roads on the res were quiet, trees bending under the weight of snow. When I passed the frozen swamp, a voice moaned out. I stopped walking. Nothing. So I kept on going on the sparkling road until I heard it again. Who's that? I yelled. The moan came again. It was a man somewhere in the swamp. I got closer, listening. There it was, a low and breathy noise, and with my cold ear, I followed it. The swamp was frozen solid, the snow blown in piles, and so I slid over the ice, looking for the source of the noise. Moonlight through bare tree limbs lit the swamp, and caught among the tree stumps and solid snow was a person sprawled out on the ground. He was trying to sit up, but kept falling back, like he'd just done 1,000 crunches and was too sore to do just one more. It was Fellas. Fellas, I asked, standing over him. He tried to, Fellas tried to sit up, but something pulled him back down. Fuck you, Fellas said, help me. He groaned, shivered. He didn't say how to help him, so I had to squat down to get a better. I flicked my lighter and his purple lip quivered. Hurry, he said. Fellas, I said, I can't help you if I don't know what's the matter with you. My hair, he said. I looked at it with the lighter's flame. Holy, I said, and I laughed. Instead of the tight braid that shined, Phyllis's hair had come undone. It was frozen into the snow. Get me out, D, he said. D, get me out. At first, I tried to pull the hair out from the snow, tried to chip the snow away, but his hair wouldn't come loose, so I yanked and Phyllis screamed. Lift your head up, I said. I opened my pocket knife, and at the click of the blade, Phyllis spoke. Wait, wait, he said. Don't cut it. What do you want me to do? Tell the ice to let go, I said. Phyllis spit. Go to my house and get boiling water. I closed the pocket knife. Fellas, I said, by the time I got back here, the water would be chilled. He was quiet. As if something walked around or among us, the ice cracked and echoed somewhere in the swamp. The moon shone bright, and I looked. There was nobody but us. I have to cut it, I said. You ain't getting out if I don't. Fellas asked if I had a cigarette, and when I told him no, he cursed. Fucking bullshit. Fucking goddamn winter. What the fuck? I laughed. It ain't funny, D. Look, I said, you want me to cut my braid, too? Fellas took a deep breath and he coughed and gagged. No, he said, just cut it. I gotta get home. I'm sick. I opened the pocket knife again, grabbed his hair in a fistful and cut. When I got up to the last bit of hair, Fellas rolled over and away from where he'd been stuck. He rubbed his head like he just woke up. I helped him stand and we slipped all over the ice on our way out of the swamp. Through dry heaves, Fellas said he'd missed the bus this morning to the methadone clinic. No shit, I said, because I didn't see him on the bus or at the clinic. And he thought some booze would be good before he got sick from not having any methadone. He'd had a bit of booze left that afternoon when he decided to go see Rab to get some pot. But on the way, he'd stopped off in the swamp to feel the quiet that came with too much drinking. And when he plopped down in the snow, he dozed right off. When he woke up, his hair was frozen in the snow. I got him to his mom's, Beth's, where he still lived. He walked fine by himself to the door, but I walked with him up the steps. I never thought I'd scalp a fellow tribal member, I said. Fuck off, he said. He fumbled in his pocket for his house key. You want to smoke, I asked. Didn't you listen, he said. I didn't make it to Rab's. He unlocked the door. I'll go for you, I said. Give me the cash. Phyllis looked at me. Twenty minutes, I said. I'll run there and back while you warm up your pretty bald head. He gave me thirty bucks, and I didn't ask where he got it from. Yesterday, he said he didn't have any money. 20 bag, Phyllis said, and stop at Jim's and get some tall boys and a bag of chips, any kind of Humpty Dumpty chips. Down Phyllis's driveway, I imagined the look on Rab's face when I gave him the money. what I tell you? How about that, Graham? D, Phyllis yelled. One more thing. Bring me my hair so we can burn it. Don't want spirits after us. We're damned anyway, I said. But I guess I'll get your hair. I kept going, wondering, hair or pot first? Pot made the most sense. It would look strange having to set the hair and ice down like a soaked mop on the counter at Jim's while I reached in my pocket for Phyllis' money. Jim, that old wood booger, would say, we don't take those anymore. I'd look him square in his sagging face and say, I'm not trading no hair, you old fucker. And I'd smack down on the counter a $10 bill for the tall boys and chips. 
with the change jingling in my pocket, I'd walk to Rab's and he'd say, get that hair out of here. It's dripping on my floor. And I'd have to plop the hair on the muddy white floor in the hallway while Rab re rayed the same nugs he weighed earlier for me. No, I'd grab Phyllis's hair from the swamp on my way home. With Phyllis on his unmade bed, me on a torn beanbag in the corner, each of us with a tall boy in the pot smoke haze and gray the room, we keep poking and squeezing the hair, waiting for it to dry, waiting to burn it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for reading that, uh, Morgan. It was uh, it's wonderful. And uh, prior to letting folks into this event and everything, we were talking about how you know this is the the opening story uh, to the collection, and um, it's one that you know I every story in the collection is wonderful. And like I said, if folks haven't had a chance to pick it up, please do. Um, but it really resonated with me and just how. How much action and story and character development was able to be contained in such a short uh, amount of time and how you consciously decided to uh, put this book, put this story first in the book um, for perhaps marketing purposes and otherwise. So I was actually kind of it, it kind of reminded me about I mean, you had talked about how they, these these stories interweave and everything. Um, when you began this, um, did you look at this as a a a project of short stories that were going to be interwoven and connected, or you know, like did they begin as standalone pieces um, that were eventually interconnected through revision? Or when you started this out, did you say I'm going to write, you know, multiple short stories about, uh, you know, uh, this this character, uh, David or D? As he gets older, um, could you kind of talk a little bit about that process? Oop, I think you're muted right now too. Um, yeah, I wish I was. I wish I was smart enough to know that the last thing you said was the thing I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> it would have saved me a lot of time. But the no, originally I wanted to write a story collection with just recurring characters, and I wanted each story to stand alone. Um, when I went into my MFA program at Stone Coast, I had like three or four stories told from David's point of view. I had um, the story Night of the Living Reds, which is the title story. And it's actually the first story I, I wrote from David's point of view. Um, and then I had Smoke's Last, which is in the book. And then I had um, two other stories that didn't end up making it in because they just they just weren't good um but they were blueprints for other stories that i went on to write eventually and i was like all right so i'll write this you know i i guess i saw this framework or this scaffold i was like all right well i have david as kind of like a young adult at like 18 and they're living res and i was like well what if we start you know from the very beginning and he's you know young coming to the reservation escaping something with his mother and so I wrote that story in a jar and I just kept writing stories chronologically in my mind um, until I got to the Night of the Living Reds. And I wrote probably maybe like 14 or 15 stories told from David's point of view. Um, and I chose 10 of the best ones and I, and I, and I had the book, you know, in, on my computer and I was looking at it and I was like, it just didn't work. It didn't work as like a, um, it, it just wasn't like some of the like the story some of the stories were good you know like um some some of the stories were good but as like a book it didn't work because it was neither it was neither a traditional story collection where like you know think um george saunders or karen russell um you know where there's where each story is like in a different setting and there's different characters and like different situations and places and you know maybe the the only commonality between all of it is, you know, theme or maybe subject matter. But this was the same. These were the same people, just a little bit older, you know. And so when you get a book like that, the reader expectation is that there's some type of overarching arc to it. Not that you're getting individual short stories, at least that had that was my experience. And so I was like, well, this sucks. This doesn't work. So I was like, I'm just going to whatever. I'll go. I'll go do something else. Um, and I'd heard this story about this guy getting his hair 
this native guy getting his hair frozen in the snow and um, this white guy uh, cut him loose from, from the snow. And I thought it was just such a, like a visceral image and, and incident like that had so many paradoxes and it was like, you think of scalping and mm -hmm. the atrocities with it, but then you think about this moment and it's like this white guy is literally cutting this native dude's hair just to literally save his life. So he doesn't die of hypothermia, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was just it was so much there. And, so I was like, all right, well, the book failed. I was like, I'll go write this story. And I kept hearing this name in my head, Fellas. And um, and I was like, all right, well, we'll have Fellas be the guy who gets his hair frozen. And so I wrote Burn, um, thinking it didn't belong to the story collection at all, thinking it was its entirely different thing, but nonetheless set in the same universe, um, you know, the Penobscot Nation. And... I, re I was revising it and revising it and revising it. And like the last thing I had left to do for, for real like revision was name the character because there's this line in the story that goes, get me out, D, fella said, D, get me out. And I knew for like rhythm purposes that the character's name needed to be said there. Um, like I just, know, I just knew it. So I was like, well, and I had been so used to writing from David's point of view that I wanted to say David, but I was like, no, I was resisting it. I was like, no, this is not David. This has nothing to do with it. So I just put the letter D in, or the letter D had been in there for a placeholder. Um, but then eventually I just stopped resisting and I was like, you know, I was like, well, wait a minute, what if this is David, but he's like much older, like what he, like much older than he is in Night of the Living Reds and, you know, in his, in his, you know, early to mid thirties or something. And um, all of a sudden I was like, once I stopped resisting it, resisting it, I was like, this question emerged, which was what happened. And so that brought everything back to life. You know, that was like, you know, I was like, well, okay, how did we get from these stories of David and then get these stories of, of Dee and Fellas? And, um, I just started writing again a bunch of D and Fella stories, but it's interesting if you look at the book. The you know the David stories are like almost unmovable. Like you can't really move them. Like you can't move in a jar because of time. Like time is really binding them. Whereas the D and Fella stories are really kind of timeless in a way. Like there's there's no. I mean there's a sense of time, but like with minimal re revision, you could like move those stories all around. They could be in any in any order that you wanted them to be in. And so I wrote all these stories and I, and I put it together that way. And that's when I realized, okay, I was onto something. I had, I had a question, so to speak, that was like guiding the book and guiding the reader. Okay. Well, that that's interesting. You had mentioned too, like, I, I I noticed that too uh, between the David and D story. There's there is a very different tone between them, and and like D's stories do feel as if they're floating. I mean I mean I think and 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 it almost you know aligns with the addictions and stuff that he's struggling with as well. Whereas you know these these earlier stories with David are much more grounded in like you know these are the moments that make the person that eventually grows up and stuff. And that, and I like how that. Um, lays itself out in in the book. Um, and the other thing that I heard was it, it almost like you just basically have to ultimately trust yourself after a while and just say, you know what, maybe this is the way that it should go and 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 move in that direction and be able to create, you know, this whole new collection of um, uh, stories from an older point of view and stuff uh, and, and being able to intersperse them uh, together. Um, so you started this as, you know, you had said as a book, how did the publication process work? Because, I mean, a, a lot of these stories were published in uh, literary magazines and stuff like that. Were you submitting them as you had written it? Or, like, did you walk away from that book when you said this isn't working out and tried other things? Or, like, uh, did you have them all finished all at once and then just started submitting them all at once? Or No, I would submit them as... Um when they would be done, um, mm -hmm. I would, I would, you know, submit to places like I remember, um, submitting in a jar, you know, when my, men my mentor, Rick Bass was like, oh, this is great. You know, let's, you know, submit this somewhere. Um, and then, you know, I, I was no stranger to the submitting game. I had been submitting mm -hmm. stories, you know, I'm 32 now. I'd been submitting stories since I was like 19. 
Um, and like, I remember when it was, you'd, you'd go, you'd have to go buy the, the writer's marketplace yeah. big book, you know, and like look through them and you're like, Oh, look, there's four money symbols with this one, you know, and send my story <laughs> there. Um, so like I, I it was no stranger at all to submitting. Um, although I did take a hiatus for a bit, I think just because I needed to, um, just needed to focus on writing. But with this, you know, no, I was um, writing them as stories and then submitting them. And, you know, before the book was even accepted for publication, before the book was even had an agent representing it, you know, several stories. I mean, the majority of the book had been published in, in magazines and places. OK, so, so it's a similar walk to what a lot of short story collections are like, but ultimately, you know, the, the final product is a a different uh, beast in and of itself because I mean you have to uh, organize the stories in such a way to you know uh, be able to interlink them and everything like that and you had mentioned um, you know there are you had mentioned like George Saunders pieces that are standalone and everything like that one of the things I, I was reminded of um, reading this was Olive Kitteridge and how you know Elizabeth Stroud is able to interweave a lot of each each narrative in, back to Olive in one way or another or, or characters who are related to her and stuff um, where they can certainly serve as standalone pieces, but they can also, um, as Paul alluded to, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Paul in a second here, but uh, it being a novel almost, rather than a collection of short stories, because you're following the same character throughout it, it's like, is this a collection of short stories or is this a novel? Um, do you think it matters one way or another what it's called? Um, I mean, the... The writer in me is like no or like the artist in me is like no it's like sort of like screw categorization in a way you know because it's related so it's so related hardcore to capitalism and the way books get you know crushed and the way that books get amplified and all this you know nonsense and so the art part of me is like i don't care uh but then the other part of me is kind of like well I'd love to talk about it, you know, like it's interesting to talk about, you know, within the context mm -hmm. of craft, though, you're not thinking about sales and business and stuff. But, um, yeah, I see it as a story collection. I think it does. It functions much more as a story collection than it does a novel. You know, novels tend to be so expansive and, you know, short story collections tend to draw their power from what's left out. And I think that this book really has those silences in it that give it that extra power that the novel doesn't have or what the novel doesn't get its power from. Right. That makes sense. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Paul, did you want to ask a question or two before we started pulling some from the chat? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jacob. And I want to just remind our audience that uh, if you type your questions in the Q&A or the chat, we will see them and we will uh, uh, surface them to uh, Morgan. So Morgan, I, I wanted to kind of stay on the subject of publication really quick uh, because your first publication is a collection of short stories, which is sort of unusual. Um, it seems like these days, at one, at one point, it wasn't so unusual, but more and more, it seems like publishers are looking to, to break a, no a new writer out with a novel rather than a collection of short stories. Um, it occurred to me that maybe the kind of hybrid nature of your, of this collection maybe made it more palatable to a publisher, uh, you know, from a sales perspective. But I'd, I'd love to hear your take on um, what enabled you to, 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 to kind of break out with a short story collection. I mean, is that something that aspiring writers should, should think of as a, as an option? Um, you're going to, I mean, you're going to ha have like a much more difficult time selling a story collection than you are a novel. Um, you know, I, you know, with my current agent, when we went out on submission with this book, you know, we went to the big houses. Um, but then my agent had also recently met uh, Maisie Cochran, who's the editor, who's an editor at Tin House. And she was like, I really liked her. She's like, I really want to submit to her and, and submit to Tin House. And so we did. And, um, you know, we got, you know, really the big publishers were taking their sweet time because they didn't know. Um, it's really interesting because they didn't know I was I was a nobody. You know what I mean? Like I had a, 
I'd published a couple stories. I'd won a couple of, of prizes, you know, so they they didn't really care. And um, compared to a different situation in which, um, you know, this went on for, for months and months and months, you know, and compared to selling another book, um, which I really can't talk about, that was like everybody was jumping at it. Um, like it was just crazy right. how, how fast it went because I was um, because of this book. And um, but I think if you have a short story collection, like I have friends who have short story collections and who have great agents and who end up getting deals. And a lot of the times I find that it's like it, it's good to have a novel. <laughs> like it is good to have a novel in the works because it helps you secure an agent and it helps you work with an agent and build that relationship and it helps you ultimately get your foot in the door like i have a friend who just got a two book deal um at viking um for a good a, a good a, a good advance for his story collection and his novel um but um so they they were they were sold uh together though right they were kind they of were a sold bundle, together bundle yeah. deal yeah yeah in in me i was kind of like i had been searching for agents for a long time and like they all kept saying the same thing they're like oh this you know a lot of this is going to stick with me for a long time but i just i don't know how to sell it um which is basically i don't think i can get a lot of money for it um right. in, in right. other words and so eventually i was just kind of like i just said Tin House quickly, really quickly, was like, oh, we love this. We want it. And my agent was like, okay, well, we'll hold on for a little bit. We're going to wait to hear back from other ed, uh, editors at big publishing houses to see if we could get a lot of money. And um, we were waiting and waiting and waiting, and we just didn't hear it. We, they kept saying, oh, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you soon. We'll get back to you soon. And then finally, I just said, you know, I said to my agent, Rebecca, I was like, you know what? I was like, screw this. I was like, we're we're going like Tin House. Like let let them, let me talk to. Them. They had gotten back to us again, being like, hey, any updates? And I talked to the editor, uh, Maisie, and she saw the book exactly as I had seen it. Like she had no intention of going into this book and like making it into a novel. Like she saw it exactly as it was meant to be seen. Um, you know, she came at it from an artistic standpoint, and I was like. I didn't say it to her, but I was like, you're hired, you know, <laughs> essentially. And right. So I just I just decided to go with Tin House. And, you know, they gave me a really, you know, a very small advance because they're a small publishing house. I think I got like. Three thousand dollars, you know, um, which is which is small compared to, you know, getting, you know, a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar advance at, you know, Viking or something like that. Um, but you know, it was, it wasn't about that. It was like, okay, now I have a book coming out and it just, you know, my wife and I were like, oh, well, this will be a stepping stone to the ne next book because we'd seen so many writers at Tin House publish their first book there and then go on and get a major deal with a bigger publishing house because Tin House is really good at, at selling books. And, um, but I, I could have done that also, but I chose to stay with Tin House for my novel, uh, which is coming out next summer, um, just because they are very good at what they do. And um, yeah, I was like, whatever happens, happens. And here we are. I mean, the book ended up winning a lot of awards and being named, you know, finalists or long lists to so many of my CV looks ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to. Um... Bring a question out of the chat for you. Yeah. Um, this is from, uh, well, I won't mention who it's from, I guess, but anyway, it says you mentioned the things that get left out of stories. It seems that happens frequently with short stories, giving them their punch. Is that something you set out to do? Is it a writing technique you use? And if not, what is your approach to developing a short story? Yeah, I think for short stories for me, it's kind of like, it's like I'll, I'll draft a short story and then, you know, I kind of, I'm going to use a metaphor here, I guess, or yeah, metaphor, like the stories, this, this painting that I've done and it's like, okay, now I have this, you know, this white paintbrush and it's like, how much, how much white can I put on this painting until the reader can't recognize it anymore for what it actually is? You know what I mean? Like, I like, I think short fiction, makes the reader work and that they have to 
piece together. Um, they have to meet the writer halfway um, or they have to meet the story halfway. And so for me, like that's how I sort of set out to write short stories. I mean, obviously for me, it's like, that's not what I want to do. Like that's ultimately where I end up with short fiction. But in the beginning, it's always about like, it's always about character. It's always about setting. It's always, it's always about what characters want um you know and how that affects plot and how that pushes the story forward um and so that's where i start and then i usually hopefully luckily if i have any luck at all get to a point where the story has that imagistic quality and then i'm then i take you know the delete you know the i delete you know a lot is you know i turn a 20 page story into 10 pages or right you know sometimes one page you know when i go from there would, would you say that that is the the central part of your revision process is is like um, concision and cutting stuff that doesn't belong and seeing how much you can take out. Yeah, and I mean, for me, I mean, the best I mean, it's it's really weird when, in, when I was younger, I was like drafting was the thing I love to do. You know, I hated revision and now that I'm older, I hate drafting and I love revising because revising just is like so much easier. I don't know why, but like like I, I, I don't like I'll write a 30 page story and then recognize in it that it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And I'll just, you know, put it in the drunk and the drunk, the, the junk folder and start over. You know what I mean? And that doesn't bother me. Like, that's the work that you have to do. Like, you can't be afraid to start over. You can't be afraid to be like, you know, and, and I don't look at stories as being failures. I look at stories as just being like, oh, OK, I didn't take as I, I didn't take as many steps as I was supposed to take. So let me just start over, you know, and we'll call it, you know, this will be the new starting point. Um, but that that's sort of how my brain sort of processes it. And it, it seems like that's kind of what you did with Night of the Living Res. I mean, you had a book uh, that was compiled of short stories, some of which were the stories that wound up in Night of the Living Res, but you realized it wasn't holding together. And rather than just kind of like um, beat your head against the wall and trying to make it work, you ultimately came to the point where you were able to kind of listen to that part of yourself that knew all along, hey, this is what you need to do with this book. And then began a very difficult process, I assume, which was writing a lot of other stories that kind of fleshed out your your vision um, in, into, into the final form of the book. Yeah, I mean, exactly. It was it was exactly that. It was like, you know, just as I'd set out with the David stories, you know, the Dean and Bellis, I ended up having, you know, around 13, 14 of those too. And then it was a matter of choosing five of the best ones and then choosing five of the best um, David stories to compose this. And then Tin House said they wanted some other stories and they did end up taking two other D stories. Uh, so for a total of 12 in, in mm -hmm. the book, um but yeah it, it was really about you know how much can i generate and then how much of that do i just get out of the way that's no good you know right. and what am i left with um right. like the uh the sand sifter with gold or whatever you know there's all right. that sand there I mean, then if you're lucky you'll get it you'll get some money <laughs> it also reminds me a little bit of like you know hemingway's idea of you know the the iceberg and how much of the story really is below the surface and how much needs to be on the surface and you know his belief that very little needed to be overtly stated in the story yeah. and and the absences and the, the silences and the gaps were were where the power of the story resided I think that's certainly true of a lot of the stories in in your in your book um have uh, we've got a lot of great questions in the in the chat but i wanted to ask you a question uh about you've got you've got some of the stories in the book are about David as a young a young person and then some of them are D who's older um and I know that I'm t I, I don't want to uh suggest that that the story that the, this novel is autobi or this collection of short stories is autobiographical because you sh happen to share certain characteristics uh of your of your uh main character you you too grew up in in uh the Penobscot reservation what I'm imagining, and you can tell me if I'm full of crap or not, but I'm imagining that the David character might be closer to some of the experiences that you actually had. And then there came a, like a divergence point where you went in one way and D went another. And I'm just wondering, uh, how did you keep these voices distinct in your in your head? Uh, yet at the same time, um, delve into material that was so personal. 
Yeah, um, no, you're completely, that's, I mean, that's actually how I have sort of like synthesized, when people ask me the autobiographical aspects of this book, that's how I sort of synthesize it. I say, well, Dave is much more closer to who I am and my lived experiences than Dee and Phyllis are. Although the themes of their lives are, you know, themes that I'm familiar with too. Um, but for for me, before I started writing fiction, I was a nonfiction writer and I wrote a lot of memoir. So I wrote a lot of personal stories. Um, and it just over the years of learning the craft of nonfiction and 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 bumping up against some of its limitations and some of the things I didn't want to do. I found myself being like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? So I started to gradually move into the fiction world. And so as I got more into the fiction world, you know, I always, there was always some part of real life that was, you know, part of the story. You know, it could be, the story could be 98% fictional and 2%, you know, factual based off of something I'd seen or heard or experienced. Um, or it could be 75% uh, nonfiction and then 25% um, fiction. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, two examples I always give is Safe Harbor, for example, um, with D and that story all the way up until the car accident is, is pretty much nonfiction. You know, as I went and saw my mother who experienced depression and saw her have a seizure and all this stuff. Um, and so like that story there, the exterminator, um, just, just everything, the woman who needed the pack of cigarettes, like all of that stuff, you know, the, the quote in the story was real and all of it. I wrote it down the day I got, when I went home that day. And, um, but I turned it into a piece of fiction because I didn't know what to do with it otherwise. Um, but then you get a story like earth speak and I never robbed a tribal museum, you know, for, to, to get, to get money for root clubs. But I did see one day on the highway, um, I think the opening line of the story or somewhere near there is like at the top of the hill, um, fog covered above the pine trees, like the webs of fall web worms and the crooks of brown branches or something. And that was a line I told my wife to type out when we were driving because I saw it and it was really nice. So that's like, you know, 1% real, you know, versus right. the everything else that's that's fictional. But yeah, I think, you know, to keep the tones different, different it's just a matter of, you know, paying attention to synt syntax, you know, paying attention to diction, you know, being mindful of, um, you know, you know, what characters want, what characters will do. Um, and it, it's a lot of work to, to really like be able to change voices and to change tone um, and to keep them consistent throughout. Um, and that's what, you know, editors are for also, they can help you see where that falters. Um, you know, a, a, a good reader, you know, if you have a friend who's a good reader, is also a great resource to help you. You know, I think people think of writers as these, you know, solitary creatures, and that may be true for some, but I think for many, it's actually a, a much more collaborative process. Did you have that sort of experience in your MFA? Um, the collaborativeness yeah just getting that kind of useful feedback yes and no I, i've always tended to be kind of pretty private with my work um but i've always but i developed you know you know a good strong 10 person relate you know maybe 10 people that i would you know at various times send different pieces to you know that i feel that they would have a good eye on you know if I'm writing nonfiction. I have a friend who I know would would give me the best feedback possible. If I'm writing fiction, I have you know somebody who I know would give me the best possible feedback that that they that I could get. Um, and so I never was I never joined writing communities after like uh, workshops. That is, you know, I'm I'm big with you know literary communities and stuff and taking part in those. But when it came to my writing, I was always very kind of like. I feel like I can figure this out. And if I can't, maybe I'll call upon Joe Schmo to read this and <laughs> tell me what to do correctly. Let me pull another question out of the chat and then I will turn it back over to Jacob. Um, do you have any sort of routine for when you're writing? Something that gets you into the, in the zone? Do you write every day? Do you listen to music when you write? What, what's your method? 
Um, right now, I have no idea. Um, the I have a seventh month old, and so my writing oh. life has changed <laughs> drastically. Um, but my I've come to realize that you know I don't I don't beat myself up when I haven't written for a while. Um, you know, I just that's I'm just not that type of writer. I'm not Stephen King. I can't sit down and write two thousand words a day. I've tried it. I, you know, mentally have you know killed myself trying to do that type of. I tend to write best. Strangely, I don't know why. You know, seven hundred and fifty words to two thousand tops. Like somewhere in between there is my sweet spot for a day of writing. Mm -hmm. um, and I just realized like anything over that and I'm just I can't do anything the next day. I've overworked myself. Um, anything under that I have just been kind of lazy. Um, and so when the one constant, the one thing, however, is that um, when I am in the when I set out to write a project, I see it through from beginning to end. So that means setting aside time every single day, with the exception of Saturday and Sunday, unless I feel strongly about working on it, um, to see the project through. Um, so that's my one thing. And if I start something, I need to finish it, even if it is even if it's terrible. Um, and that might take me a week if it's a short story. It might take me three to six months if it's a novel, you know, um, but then I'll take some time away to live, you know, to to read, you know, to kind of um, rejuvenate, so to speak. Um, but that's really my routine and I can really write anywhere. But my ideal my ideal setup is um, having YouTube on and listening to just a dryer, like white noise. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just because like I used to working on this book um, in my next in my other book, I would bring my wife to work and I'd come home and we always had laundry to do and it was right below where, where I wrote. So I would hear the washer, I hear the dryer and I always had that noise in, in the background and, and I just had kind of like, like when I have to write, I just throw that on. Like when I know when, when I need to get down to business that the dryer gets turned on. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, Jacob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure, thanks, Paul. Um, so, Morgan, you also teach at UMaine Orno, and uh, you're on the faculty at Stone Coast, and um, you're also, I believe, uh, prose editor at the Massachusetts Review. So, I pull, pull, with all of that in mind, uh, pulling this question from the chat, um, you know, there's a rise in chat GPT and large language models. Um, so. AI is being used more frequently and stuff. And we've actually even seen uh, it be such an existential threat to writers that collectively, I think a dozen of them um, uh, came together to sue, <laughs> to say, stop using our words uh, 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 to uh, help this program learn artificial intelligence and everything. But is there any, any from your perspective as a teacher and instructor and writer as well like you know is is this a threat or can there be a a benefit to it um how should we approach it in the creative writing programs or have you noticed it yourself as a as an instructor that that this is starting to be a threat to the creative aspect of writing or is it still one of those things that seems more like I guess helpful in nature where it can help, you know, maybe create a cover letter uh, for a piece of or a fiction that one is sending out or something like that. But beyond that, you know, it's it's pretty early in the works with uh, writing creative stuff. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I think it'll find its place. You know, I think I don't think it's going to disappear. I mean, maybe it will. Maybe it will just not. It, it won't work. It'll hit like a, a ceiling in, in some sort of way. Um, I've never. I've never experienced any like students submitting work that's used. If they have, they did a really good job masking it um, by either taking what the machines spit out and then fixing it, which is always interesting. Um, because it's like you probably would have wrote a better paper if you just did it yourself. Um, right. But I haven't run into that. And I know my un University of Maine is obviously, you know, 
keeping an eye on it and talking about um, talking about it. Apparently, somebody wrote an essay about my book using it um, at UMaine in a class, and it was a really bad paper. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I mean, can a machine can a machine absorb all of this literature and then produce something transcendental? I don't. I don't know. You know, that's. I mean, we'll we'll find out. I think. I think the big difference between, you know, I think, I think those machines can perhaps fake emotion, but they don't mm -hmm. truly know what it is, and that's and that's the distinguishing factor between a writer and you know Chat GBT or any other AI device um, is the fact that we can feel, you know, or. Mm -hmm. Who knows the machines feel? I don't know. They really feel in some weird way. I don't know. But um, yeah, I think you know it's just yeah. I don't know. I, it's hard to answer. It'll be interesting to see in the next you know five to ten years like what what it does. And a lot of it has I think yeah. it, it its potential is linked also to how many how much money is used against it. You know to to shut it down. Versus how much money is used to leverage it, you know, over um, what was it? An AI had written, had finished writing the George R. R. Martin books or something like that. There was like something like that. Or, yeah. yeah. And that's why, um, yeah, I think him and John Grisham and a few others were like, this needs to stop. But yeah. I think, I mean, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, though, too, about short stories and uh, one of my uh, Pierce, who was an undergraduate uh, with me, and he, he eventually went to a low res MFA too. He always, when he was reading short stories, would always say, There's the story, and then there's the story story. <laughs> and the story story is that underlying thing that, like, you, when you're removing information from what you're writing and you're taking stuff out, and there's the allusion to what's underneath the undertow of the character's struggles and stuff. Uh, and there's that surface level stuff. And I feel like AIs might be good at doing surface level stuff, but being able to get to like what you said that that transcendental moment of 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 just the deep uh, emotions and everything, I, I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, so, and certainly, uh, so yeah, I, I thank you for answering that because it, it is a question that often lingers, and and someone had asked it in the chat, and I, I'm I'm happy to have uh, uh, addressed it. Uh, kind of going back though to uh, your own writing. Um, this takes place on the Penobscot Indian Island Reservation. Um, so, for those unfamiliar with the area in Maine, it's kind of it's kind of near Orono and and University yep. of Maine um, in the Penobscot River. Um, how do you set you know these fictional? I, I, we we talked a little bit about autobiography and stuff in them as well, but how do you set a fictionalized story while maintaining? You know that real place's heart and and meaning and purpose. Um, I myself, I I live a couple hours south of you, uh, on the coast, uh, yeah, Brunswick, and I've 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 not been up to Werno personally, but I certainly feel like I have <laughs> from reading this collection and stuff. Like, how are you able to do that and 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 maintain its 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 reality? I guess even though it's a fictionalized account. Yeah, I think, you know, just knowing a place really, really well is so important. You know, I think if you're going to write about a place, you need to go there. Um, you know, I think that's what's so great. What's so great about grants, you know, grant money um, is, you know, that can sort of give you the means to travel to another country, for example, and, you know, live there and absorb aspects or elements of its culture you know get to know the way the streets move and you know curve and those sort of things so i feel like you just need to know a place intimately to write about it like maybe you can hop on google maps and do street view and kind of like walk around that way but you'll be you'll you'll, you'll be limited and you know in um, that sense um but yeah for me it's it's just about you know, nailing down the specifics of what makes that place unique, right? Like, what what is it that, um, you know, what is it that you can never forget about it? And for me, it was always the water. It was always the trees scratching against me. It was always, 
um, the roads, it was always the cold, um, you know, it was always the movement of just being able to go anywhere on this, on this island, um, and, you know, getting and capturing that in each story, I think just helped create that sense of setting that the reader felt, you know, very, very present, you know, using those sensory details to, you know, the maximum. And how far back was it when you started to decide, you know, I want to, I want to write these things down. I want to share these things and become a writer. Like what, what was your journey like? Um, you had mentioned you had uh, gone to Stone Coast, if, if I'm correct, uh, uh, for the MFA. Is that a low res MFA? It is, is it? yes. Okay, so um, you you went there, um, worked with Rick Bass, I believe you had said. Yep, I worked with Rick Bass, Aaron Hamburger, yep. and Kara Hoffman. Okay, um, how'd you get there? Like, I mean, well, can you like can you fill us in on that journey a little bit? What made you decide? I want to share these stories with others, um, with an audience who might not be familiar with the Penobscot Nation, um, who might not be, you know, from New England uh, or, or otherwise. Uh, what ultimately made you decide to share these stories and, and write them down? Um, no, I, you know, I, never, I didn't do well in high school. Um, you know, I had a lot of, you know, issues at home that I impeded my ability to do well um, or to even go to school, and so. You know, when I graduated, you know, there were very few schools that that accepted me. Um, and one of the you know, one of the few was Eastern Maine Community College. And so I went there for three years and um, I went there for three years. And then I transferred to Dartmouth where I did four years and then I went and got my MFA. Um, but it was or I was about 18 when I just started, you know, when I started college and I was out of I wasn't at home. and just, I don't know, there was this quiet that I'd never quite experienced before. And um, I started reading and I started to really fall in love with with literature, not because it was something different, but rather it was something that I recognized I had been doing for a very long time, which was telling stories orally. Um, I mean, growing up, I loved telling stories. I loved, I mean, that's all we did. Um, you know, me and my friends, you know, hanging out, smoking cigarettes or drinking, you know, I was the one who was always telling stories you know I was like I don't want to say I was a memory keeper but I was the one who would like bring up stuff that happened you know the day before or a week or a month or a year ago and, and recount the whole thing and set it up and I, and I just loved that and I rec I was like I was like oh no shit you people can do this you know people can can write and you know potentially make a living out of it and so I just kind of never never really questioned it and I just went with it um, and I wound up at the Stone Coast MFA, you know, you know, not, not really, not really looking to, I mean, definitely looking to tell these stories, but looking to really learn how to tell these stories as best as I could, as I did orally with my friends, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I wanted, I wanted those stories I told cold at night around a fire to be as potent, you know, to a different audience um, in the same way. That makes sense. Uh, and uh, it's it's interesting because I feel like you can you can feel that in in your writing as well. Um, ultimately, it's it's the storyteller, right? Uh, that that's what's happening here. And um, well, yes. So th thank you for sharing uh, the journey. We, what what when you started finding that silence and you were able to um, pick up uh, literature and stuff. Was there any particular author or uh, genre of writing that you were drawn to that that really interested you or? Yeah, there was, um, I loved Chekhov. I loved his short fiction um, and his plays and stuff. And strangely, um, Jack Kerouac and all of the whole beat generation, I, I've, I've read everything by, by the most obscure beat writers, you know, um, and um, but really just because, you know, I grew up in in Maine, um, but my dad lived in Connecticut. And so every summer I used to take, you know, since I was little, I would take the Greyhound bus down to Bridgeport and, you know, I'd stop in South Station and, 
you know, the sense of on the road. And there was something to the book, you know, that kind of like resonated with me, you know, being on the move and going place to place and, and you know, being down there, you know, working for the summers at moving at moving companies and and just just stuff like that. And I've gone back and I've reread, you know, on the road. And um, I mean, Carol Active Voice is just it's so beautiful, it's so gorgeous, but it just it, it 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 doesn't read how it did when I first read it, you know. Um, but those are the first two that um, the two writers that I fell in love with. And then it was Russian literature and Beat Generation. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah, I um, I've had those experiences as well. Go, like having read an author and being blown away and then going back and being like, but just, something has changed slightly. Still good. Like J.D. Salinger, yeah. Catcher, in the, Catcher in the Rye was like that for me. But uh, yeah. Um, well, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we I let me double check and make sure I didn't miss any uh, qu pertinent questions. Um, I think we've covered a lot of them and and everything. And uh, again, uh, just want to thank you. I, we're 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 getting up to nine o'clock here, and I know uh, we want to end um, on time and everything. So uh, thank you again uh, so much for uh, uh, sharing your time with us and and just and talking about uh, this wonderful collection. Um, as a final note, uh, you know what what's next? I know are, are you is are you continuing to um, I believe you said you you teach. Do you teach both at Stone Coast and U Maine or now? Or yeah, my I have a tenure okay. track position oh, cool. at um, U Maine or now, and then I meant I mentor one or two students a, sem a semester from Stone Coast. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, and it, interwoven with that and raising a seven month old, which yeah. I've been there. I <laughs> I know how that is. Um, yeah. I, I well, best of luck with future writing and everything as well. Um, you had alluded to a novel coming out um, soon next year. Yeah, uh, June fourth, twenty twenty four. June fourth, twenty twenty four. Yeah. Can you share 20, the title yet, or is it? Still? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's called Fire Exit. Uh, it's already up for pre order um, and everything on Amazon, and I think Barnes and Noble and like all the big places. Um, I haven't uploaded. I haven't fixed my my uh my web page yet so if you go to my website you won't see it there but um if you go to my bio on amazon you'll see the the cover uh lit hub did a reveal i think last week or the or the week before so awesome well i am looking forward to it um and i'm, I'm looking forward to, it, to seeing you know a novel you know, it's always fun to see uh, a collection of short stories, someone releasing a collection of short stories and then releasing a novel after that and just um, being able to see the similarities and differences and everything between uh, the different styles and everything. So uh, best of luck with that. And um, again, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, and everyone who uh, attended, thank you for coming to our first Word for Word uh, event for the uh, year. Um, I see that. Paul had already put Morgan's uh, website up when I put it up as well. Uh, check it out. Again, his the new book is not quite up there yet, but you'll uh, get plenty of information about Night of the Living Res, which again, pick it up if you haven't already and uh, keep an eye out on your email for the lucky five who have uh, won a book for tonight for uh, signing up for this event as well. Um, we're so glad that you're able to join us this evening. Our next event, I believe, is scheduled for next month, and it's going to feature Elizabeth Hand, um, who's going to be discussing her latest novel, uh, Haunting on the Hill, which I believe Liz, I believe, is also is, is also in Maine, if I'm not mistaken. She, so, she also teaches at Stone Coast. We're going to have the right. entire we're going to have the entire staff of Stone Coast here, ultimately, that's, on word for word. That sounds great. I, I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, that actually, her her novel, A Haunting on the Hill, was just released this month too. So uh, feel free to pick that up before we do have her uh, next month. Um, and it should make for another memorable night. So our thanks again uh, to you, Morgan. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, best of luck with everything. And um, just, uh, it's been a wonderful night. Thanks so much, yeah, Morgan. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. It was great. Uh, thanks for having me, and hopefully it's not the last time. Yes, we'd love to have you back um, after after the next novel comes out and stuff, if you're if you're willing, for sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Awesome. That would be great.
Well, thank you and um, good luck and good night, everyone. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye, everyone.